Okay, so for the second of our performance enhancing drugs lectures, uh, we're going to be talking about the specific drugs that uh, may be used by athletes. They fall into a couple of different categories. We've got stimulants, steroids, HGH or human growth hormone, beta-2 agonists, and then finally creatine. Uh, there's a link to a YouTube video that talks more about these. Um, it's uh, kind of funny. Um, and it sometimes seems just seeing it presented in a different way can be very helpful. So I'll also post that link separately along with our lectures on web campus. Uh, so we're going to walk through these categories of drugs one by one. And we're going to start with uh, stimulants. Um, so of course the first question is, does it work? Uh, can, is it helpful to use stimulants to enhance performance? Uh, now we did talk about this when we talked about amphetamines. Uh, studies do indicate that most athletes who use amphetamines will actually perform better. Uh, but not much better. It's a very small uh, improvement that athletes will see. Of course, at very high levels of competition, those small improvements, those tenths or hundredths of a second, could really make a big difference. Now, in terms of how this actually works, the, uh, the biology is not, not clear. Uh, it could be um, that through increasing strength and masking fatigue, that physical ability is actually increased. Or it may be effects on the brain, uh, increased confidence, uh, or increase just that change to uh, a winning attitude. Uh, and of course, it could be partly a placebo effect as well, or those effects in combination. So we don't really have clear science on exactly how amphetamines work, uh, but we do know that they're, for most athletes, um, that we, they would see a small improvement in their performance. Uh, in terms of other caffeines, or, I'm sorry, other stimulants, uh, caffeine is one. Uh, we actually know that caffeine can improve endurance under laboratory conditions. Uh, we don't have really clear evidence on whether that works under real world conditions. And athletes may actually need large amounts of caffeine to see that kind of improvement, which of course can come with its own unpleasant side effects, sometimes digestive effects that would go with that. Uh, now, it is a powerful enough stimulant that the, in, the IOC actually regulates a caffeine dosage among Olympic athletes during competition. And then a final stimulant would be uh, ephedrine. We talked about its uh, role as an early stimulant, and it is actually on both Olympic and NCAA lists of banned substances. Now, our professional sports organizations were slower to ban it, so it showed up on for Olympic and collegiate athletes faster. Uh, but there were some high-profile incidents like the 2003 death of Steve Belcher that was attributed to uh, the use of ephedrine that led to um, the, its, its uh, making the ban lists in the professional sports as well. Uh, now, one of the risks with ephedrine is that it may be included in supplements but not clearly labeled. Uh, so, as always, that uh, caution, that word of caution whenever you're consuming stimulants, or I'm sorry, supplements, uh, to be very, very careful about what you're consuming uh, and the quality of the, um, the product and the supplier. So moving on to um, steroids, this is one that we hear a lot about. Um, and basically, uh, we're talking about um, substances derived from testosterone. So uh, we can see two different effects from that. Um, those androgenic effects that we talked about with the East German athletes, those uh, masculine characteristics being developed, and then the anabolic effects, and those are those tissue building effects where we see increased muscle mass, uh, different distribution of body fat, uh, and increased um, calcium deposits and uh, protein synthesis as well. Um, so, of course, our question here um, would be whether or not those steroids are effective. Effective. So when we look at research findings, um, we do see that in organisms with low testosterone levels that synthetic anabolic steroids can build muscle. Uh, now we don't see any increase in aerobic capacity or endurance among healthy men, uh, and among healthy men, the steroids at the doses that were studied did produce small increases in lean muscle mass, lean muscle mass and also muscular strength. Um, so it's unclear at those levels whether giving those steroids to um, men with normal testosterone levels, whether it's really going to have that significant effect. Of course, one of our concerns with steroids is that the doses that are considered safe to study in laboratory settings are rarely the doses that athletes are taking, right? Athletes are probably going to be taking much higher doses and maybe even higher doses combined, that concept of stacking steroids. So uh, we may see very different 
physiological and psychological effects under those conditions as well. Um, some of the psychological effects that users report uh, could be include feeling stronger and then because of that feeling being able to work harder uh, and we may also see that uh, placebo effect at work there as well. Um, now when we talk about um, why athletes are using them, uh, we've got Don Catlin who does a lot of groundbreaking work uh, in, this, in this area uh, quoted as saying if steroids didn't work, athletes wouldn't use them. So even though we can't really test it um, because of our concerns about dosing athletes at the dosing subjects at the, the rates that uh, athletes subject themselves to, uh, there is that perception that if it wasn't working, then people wouldn't do it. So the psychological effects of steroids, that idea of roid rage, uh, we do know that steroids um, may produce anecdotally this, this stimulant-like high, this feeling that people report when they're also, uh, also from taking amphetamines, uh, and that increased aggressiveness, uh, which could be very productive when we talk about a training session, uh, but over time and with high doses, uh, we could be seeing um, that uh, start to interfere uh, socially, could interfere with social relationships and other aspects of life. Um, and that's what leads us to that concept of roid rage. Uh, now, in terms of being able to document this, again, we're not going to subject athletes to the types of doses in a study that would produce this. Um, so we we don't have a lot of science behind it. Um, it could be that some of these stories are exaggerated, but they are pretty widespread. We do hear steroid users report uh, widely this uh, idea of violent feelings and actions uh, and it's definitely something that is causing concern. Um, in For particular groups of uh, particular subgroups some of the adverse effects of steroids uh, for young users uh, we can talk about stunting where the uh, the growth plates of the long bones close prematurely so uh, athletes aren't able to reach their full height uh, risks for men, uh, we actually see shrinking of the testes and enlargements of the breasts, which doesn't seem to fit, uh, but we see on the flip side of that the risks for women of decreasing breast size and those masculinizing effects. So uh, different groups of risks for men and for women. Uh, for all users, uh, we see a risk for uh, liver damage uh, and then changes in blood chemistry that can contribute to uh, atherosclerosis, high blood pressure, and heart disease. So really uh, not a pretty picture. Uh, but at the same time, in 2009, that Monitoring the Future study that we talked about, 150,000 high school athletes around the United States reported steroid use. Um, now, the great news was that this was actually a 50% drop uh, from seven years earlier. It uh, could possibly be attributed to uh, broader testing among high school athletes. Um, but athletes are reporting that pressure to use in high school uh, to start getting that, um, that edge, that competitive edge, uh, possibly access to um, more elite teams, that sort of thing, and then get clean in time for college before testing becomes more widespread. Um, unfortunately, what those athletes then would be at risk for is that premature growth plate closure and not really being able to reach their full growth. So uh, if you're interested in checking out the link to that site there, you can see uh, what the NCAA reports in terms of drug use among uh, collegiate athletes. Uh, but we did see, through the Monitoring the Future study, uh, a decline among high school athletes. So some good news there. Okay, so when we talk about um, steroids, um, we're going to discuss a little bit here about regulation. Um, so we do see, um, because this use is off-label and banned, a really large black market for these drugs. Uh, and we are seeing more concern about use just among uh, adolescent boys, non-athletes who are using them, uh, for either uh, recreational or still for training and athletic purposes. Um, analog stories are listed on Schedule 3, so there are uh, legitimate medical uses, uh, but because of those restrictions for Schedule 3 drugs, they are uh, prescribed with limited refills and they require more record keeping. Uh, now, of course, we do still see those drugs hitting the black market, uh, and at any time we see a drug uh, available illicitly, we see high cost when we see that kind of demand. So uh, we're estimating about two to four hundred dollars per week uh, for use of these drugs, and that's more, I guess, for a recreational athlete. Uh, pro athletes are actually reporting twenty to thirty thousand dollars a year on these drugs. So clearly, a lot of money, uh, and then also a lot of health risks for athletes who engage in this behavior. Okay, so we'll move on to our next category, which is HDH, or human growth hormone. Uh, and the uh, potential here is that use of this drug would be able to increase height and weight 
among users. Uh, now, what we actually see um, is a more controlled increase under certain circumstances. Um, so among uh, athletes, experiments have shown that HGH may have a slight effect on lean body mass, but not actually on performance, not on strength. And it's actually uh, illegal to distribute for non-medical purposes. So even though it's available for medical reasons uh, and for certain conditions, uh, it's actually illegal to distribute for non-medical uh, training type purposes. Um, so we actually just saw testing begin uh, last year in NFL, uh, in the NFL, some um, uh, based on some concerns about the increasing size of NFL players that it may be becoming increasingly dangerous. Uh, for the players and for their competitors. Um, now, we have seen um, also a change in um, the manufacture of this drug. Before 1986, the human growth hormone was actually recovered from cadavers, from dead bodies, and it's actually been synthesized uh, since then artificially. So um, when we look at HGH, uh, we do see legitimate medical uses under circumstance, certain circumstances. We do see that increase in height and weight that athletes may be looking for, um, but some real concerns about whether that would actually be effective in the, um, the, the competition setting. Okay, so our second to last category, beta-2 agonists. Uh, this may be something that you're familiar with uh, from other kinds of medication, uh, that idea of beta blockers. Uh, an example of these would be clinbuterol. Um, so in terms of how it works, um, we're talking about selectively stimulating a subset of adrenergic receptors. Um, so this would be uh, similar to the kinds of drugs that we see being used to treat asthma. Um, in animal studies, um, we saw a possible effect on muscle mass, but really no evidence for increased performance. Um, regardless, these have been banned for use in competition. And if we think about some of the effects of beta blockers, it may make sense. Um, some of those side effects were, include um, calming the brain, lessening tremors, and we do see um, beta blockers banned for use in competitions like biathlon, where we see um, intense physical activity, cross-country skiing, and then uh, pausing to perform a very um, calm, focused activity like target shooting. So you can see how having the ability to quickly um, calm your body uh, and reduce your heart rate and that kind of thing would give you an, uh, an illegal advantage. Okay, so finally, um, our last uh, performance-enhancing drug, creatine. Um, this tends to be one that uh, people in um, undergraduate populations are most aware of. So creatine is a natural substance. It's found in meat and fish, and it is sold legally as a dietary supplement. Um, there's no regulation or testing of creatine that I'm aware of, either in competition settings uh, or though in manufacturing settings. So you, of course, always buyer beware. As with any kind of supplement, you have to be uh, very cautious about the, um, the producer and the quality of the product. Uh, in terms of how it works, um, creatine helps to regenerate ATB, which is the what provides the energy for muscle contractions. Uh, people who use creatine do tend to gain weight. Uh, some of this is gonna be water weight, so when the use stops, that water weight goes down. Uh, and there's some evidence that it may improve strength and short-term speed in sprinting. Uh, we don't see any evidence for improvement in longer distance events, uh, and it's possible that the performance may decrease um, due to weight gain, so it may be balancing out there. We do know that overuse of creatine is linked to dehydration and also to uh, muscle cramps and uh, stomach cramps and muscle injuries. So um, although it's not uh, regulated or tested as far as I know, there are definitely some side effects um, that you should look out for if you're someone who's using creatine. Again, any questions on these that you may have, uh, feel free to post those in those uh, content questions section of the discussion boards. Uh, and it's very typical in this class for students to post questions um, about a friend or an acquaintance. Uh, so don't feel like you have to talk about your own um, use or concerns about use, you can always phrase that in a way that makes it less personal. So feel free to ask any questions. I'd be happy to help you out with what I can. Uh, so wrapping up our second and final lecture on performance enhancing drugs, um, through our mini lectures here, we talked about the history and types of drug use among athletes, starting back as early as the um, ancient Greeks and ancient Aztecs. Uh, we talked about testing, uh, kind of that, um, trend towards greater testing in the 70s and 80s, and then the use of stimulants, steroids, 
and our other categories of PEDs. Uh, please reach out with any questions and I will see you for our next set of lectures.